Hey humans, welcome to Read to Me Matt Dunn. Read to me. I'm Matt Dunn and I'm gonna read to you. You. We are reading Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. We're on chapter 20, part two. We learned Clairvaux is dead and he loves to stretch even when he's dead. We also learned that Victor is on the verge of dying, whining about it, and still not dying. Where are we gonna go next? Part two. But I was doomed to live. And in two months, found myself as awakening, as awaking from a dream in a prison. Stretchy, stretched on a wretched bed, surrounded by go ghoul, ghoul, whoa, gaulers, turnkeys, bolts, <clears throat> and all the miserable apparatus of a dungeon. He locked up. Good for him. It was morning, I remember, when I thus awoke to understanding. I had forgotten the particulars of what had have happened. The only f I bleh, and only felt as if some great misfortune had suddenly overwhelmed me. But when I looked around and saw the bare the barred windows and the squalidness of the room in which I was all flashed across my memory and I groaned bitterly. The sound disturbed an old woman who was sleeping in a chair beside me. She was a hired nurse. The, the wife of one of the turned keys and her countenance countenance express and her countenance expressed all those bad qualities which often characterized that class the lines of her face were hard and rude and so were my fucking comments god you're an asshole dude you belong there you fucking piece of shit like those of per you don't even know her like those of persons accustomed to see without sympathizing in sights of misery. Her tone expressed her entire indifference. She addressed me in English, and the voice struck me as one that I had heard during my suffering. Are you better now, sir? She said. I replied in the same language with a feeble voice. I believe I am feeble. But if it is if it be all true, if nee, if indeed I did not dream, I am sorry that I am still alive to feel this misery and horror. She's like, we got a dramatic one here. He's dramatic. For that matter, replied the old woman, if you mean about the gentleman you murdered, I believe that it were better for you if you were dead, for I fancy it will go hard with you. But you will be hung when the next sessions come on. However, that's none of my business. I am sent to nurse you and get you well. I do my duty with, my, with a safe conscience, conscience. It were well if everybody did the same. I turned with loathing from the woman who could utter so unfeeling a speech to a person just saved on the very edge of death. But I felt languid and unable to reflect on all that had passed. The whole series of my life appeared to me as a dream. I sometimes doubted if indeed it were all true, for it never presented itself to my mind with the force of reality. As the images that floated before me became more distinct, I grew feverish. A darkness pressed around me. No one was near me who soothed me with the gentle voice of love. No dear hand supported me. That you're all alone. You're all a little fucking alone. Put him in a dark room with a candle and no match and just piss on him. Piss all over him. You know what? Give him matches, piss on those fucking matches and then throw them in his face. You're all alone. The physician came 
and prescribed medicines, and the old woman prepared them for me, but utter carelessness was visible in the first, and the expression of brutality was strongly marked in the visage of the second. Who could be interested? Who could be interested? Who could be interested? Who could be interested in the fate of a murderer but the hangman? Who would gain his fee? That's right. Keep him out healthy and well for the hangman's noose. Because he's a wild goose. <laughs> These were my first reflections, but I soon learned that Mr. Kerwin had shown me extreme kindness. He had caused the best room in the prison to be prepared for me. Wretched indeed was the best. What the fuck? I am glorified as a killer, M killer McDiller, and it was he who was provided a physician and a nurse. It is true he seldom came to see me, for although he ardently desired to relieve the sufferings of every human creature, he did not wish to be present at the agonies and miserable ravings of a murderer. He came, therefore, some time to see that I was not neglected. But his visits were short and at long intervals in between. So like, not very often. One day when I was gradually recovering, I was seated in a chair, my eyes half open and my cheeks livid with those of death. I was overcome by gloom and misery. And I and often reflected I had better seek death than remain miserably pent up only to be let loose in a world replete with wretchedness. At one time, I considered whether I should not delay myself guilty and suffer the penalty of the law less innocent than poor Justine had been. I don't know what you're considering, buddy. Sure, were, such were my thoughts when the door of my apartment was opened. And Mr. Kerwin entered. Jail cell, you mean? His countenance expressed sympathy and compassion. He drew a chair close to mine and addressed me in French. I fear that, uh, that this place is very shocking to you. Uh, can I do anything to make you more comfortable? Oui? Uh, yeah, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, but all that you mention is nothing to me. On the whole earth, there is no comfort, which I am capable of receiving. Thanks. Get the fuck out. And know that the, the symphony, sympathy is a stranger, but can, can be but of a little uh, relief to one born down as you are. About so strange a misfortune. Uh, but you will, I hope, soon quit this melancholy abode. For doubtless, evidence can easily be brought. Uh, my accent is... <clears throat> Get that accent straight. But you will, I hope. Soon quit this melancholy abode, for doubtless evidence can easily be brought to free you from the criminal charge. Was that Hispanic? Was that Spanish? Like it's French and Spanish. <laughs> Me casa es su casa, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was not until a day or two after your illness that I thought of examining. Wait. Pff, wow. Wowies gabowsies. I kind of just jumped two chapters, two chap ch paragraphs. That is my least concern. I am, by a course of strange events, became become the most miserable of mortals, persecuted and tortured as I am, and had and have been. You don't even know, man. And can death be an evil to me? Fuck that. I get butt fucked by evil. Come on, bring me the news. I deserve it. 
Nothing indeed can be... Oh, wait. <clears throat> Nothing. Eh, oui, oui. I gotta go. Oui, oui, oui. Uh, applesauce. Nothing can indeed could be more unfortunate or agonizing than the strange chances that have lately occurred. You were thrown by some surprising accident on the shore, renowned for its hospitality, seized immediately and charged with murder. The first sight that was presented to your eyes was the body of your friend, murdered in so accountable a manner and placed as it were by some fiend across your path. Okay. Mr. Logic is coming in through the door, and he's like, Uh-uh. Nata, nata. This is too accurate. As Mr. Kerwin said this, notwithstanding the agitation I endured on this retrospect of my sufferings, I also felt considerably considerable surprise at the knowledge he seemed to possess concerning me. I suppose some astonishment was exhibited in my countenance, for Mr. Curran hastened to say, Ah, raviolis. Wait, no, it's Italian. Uh, ah, baguette. It was not until a day or two after your illness that I thought of examining your dress. You were wearing ladies' garments and that I might discover some trace by which I could send your relations on account of your misfortunate and illness. I found several letters, and among others, one which I discovered from its commencement to be from your father. I instantly wrote to Geneva, nearly two months having elapsed, I, I, we oui, we oui. ha ha ha! I am French. I instant, I instantly became French, and I wrote to Geneva, and nearly two months have elapsed since the departure of my letter. But you are ill. Even now you tremble. You are unfit for agitation of any kind. This guy is saying that he's got something for him and he's not going to tell him or something. I don't know. This suspense is a thousand times worse than the most horrible event. Tell me what new scene of death has been acted and whose murder am I now to fucking lament? Oh, oh sorry. I didn't mean to tell you. I, your family is perfectly well. Your, your family is like... A French fries with French gravy. How do I say? Put the butter on it. Uh -huh. Your family is perfectly well, monsieur, said Mr. Curran, with gentleness. And someone, a friend, is come to visit you. I know not by what chain of thought the idea presented itself, but it instantly darted into my mind that the murderer had come to mock me at my misery and taunt me with the death of Clairvaux. As a new incident for me to comply with his hellish desires, I put my hand before my eyes and cried out in agony, Oh, take him away! I cannot see him! For God's sake, do not let him in! Do not let him enter! <laughs> Mr. Curran regarded me as a troubled countenance. He could not help regard my ex exclamation as a presumption of my guilt and said in rather a severe tone, I should have thought, young man, that the presence of your father would have been welcome instead of inspiring such violent repugnance. My father? <gasps> I cried, cried I? Which, which while... Every feature and every muscle was relaxed from anguish to pleasure. Is my, my father indeed come? How kind, 
how very kind. But, 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 but where is he? Where is he? Where's my father? Why does he not hasten to me? Uh, probably because he's you're in jail and he can't just walk in. My change of manner surprised and pleased the magistrate. Perhaps he thought that my former exclamation was a momentary return of delirium, and now he instantly resumed his former benevolence. He rose and quitted the room with my nurse, and in a moment my father entered it. Nothing at this moment could have given me greatest pleasure than the arrival of my father. I stretched out my hand to him and cried. <sighs> Papa! It is a good thing you come to see me. <laughs> I'm going to die. Get a good look at this face, man, because it's the last you're going to see it. Tell Elizabeth it was good being her cousin, and it's too bad we didn't get to consummate that marriage, if you know what I mean. <laughs> She was so pretty. <laughs> and his dad's just like, That's not my son. Uh, I thought you meant the other murderer. Uh, you got anybody else here that's cooler? Maybe killed like some people and don't care? Can someone that really matters? Anybody? You got another open cell? Can I just... Yeah. Anyway, that was the end of part two. What an amazing, flabbergasting story. What is the father going to say, though? Really, though, he's got something to say. Maybe. He's... Who knows? Anyway, if you... If you... If you... If you... If you, if you like... To... If you want me to keep reading, if you like to me to keep reading... And if you feel like you want me to keep reading, then please check out some more of my videos. And I'm, I'm sure I'm just rambling and making you hate me. But anyway, it is okay. It is okay. Check out some more of my videos. Give me a thumbs up. Like and subscribe. Fuck the internet every chance you get. And then give comment down below. Give me something to read. Just say a word. Just be you. Be you. Thanks. Uh, let's, I'll see you tomorrow with part three. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be so good.